Making organic molecules is the most important application of organic reactions, and thousands of organic chemists dedicate their lives to designing new ways to make molecules we already know how to make and designing synthetic routes to brand new molecules. Whether they're making pharmaceuticals, agricultural chemicals, or new materials, it turns out that these materials and compounds that they're uh, learning how to make, make our lives vastly better. The design of a synthesis of an organic molecule can be a pretty daunting task if it weren't for the fact that there's a systematic approach that makes things much easier. What I want to do right now is teach you the basics of this systematic approach and to convince you that it's worth learning how to apply this approach to the design of synthesis of organic molecules. When you've got a target molecule that you want to make, the very first thing to do is notice what functional groups that molecule has. That will dictate a lot of the chemistry that you can and should do. And it lets you apply your knowledge of ways to make functional groups, which is a way of me pointing out to you that you need to organize the organic chemistry reactions that you've learned according to a classification regarding ways to make functional groups, ways to make alkenes, ways to make alkynes, ways to make alkyl halides, alcohols, diols, ketones, aldehydes, and so on. And right now, the good news is you don't know many ways to make these various kinds of functional groups, so your lists will be short and the task will be pretty easy. So, back to the systematic approach. Step one is to notice what functional groups you need to make in the molecule. Step two is to count the number of carbons in the target molecule. How big is this molecule? And the reason you'll want to know is because you'll wonder whether you need to make carbon-carbon bonds as you synthesize this molecule, and that will also be determined by what you learn in step three. Consider the molecules that are available for you to use as starting materials in your synthesis. And for this course, you usually will be given a very restricted set of materials that you can start with. So look at those materials, see how big they are. They are. Look at the target molecule, see how big it is, and that will tell you whether you need to make a carbon-carbon bond or more, or whether you can start with the molecule that already has all the carbons you need. Beyond those three steps, which are important to do at the very beginning, there's an approach to the actual rational design of a synthesis called retrosynthetic analysis that I want to introduce you to. And this approach involves actually planning the very last step first. What precursor could be used to make the target molecule in a single step? And once you identify that precursor, or perhaps more than one, then your next question is, what precursor would let me make that precursor? And so on and so forth. So you proceed to plan the synthesis in the exact opposite order that it will be carried out in the laboratory. This strategy ensures that you're always planning steps that can be done that will lead to the target molecule. It's a great simplification. Let me give you an example. Here's a compound that you almost certainly wouldn't know how to make if I said, tell me how to make this compound from small molecules. It's a steroid. And it's got some functional groups and typical places for a steroid. And it's entirely believable that this particular compound might be useful in making a variety of steroids that are used for pharmaceutical purposes. Your task is to tell me how you could make this molecule. It would be really difficult to start with some small molecule, guess whatever structure you might, and then try to plan an extended synthesis to make this large steroid molecule. But on the other hand, it's really easy. It's not hard for you at your stage, actually, to think of precursors that you could use to make this compound in a single step. So let's plan that step. Let's not aspire to do the whole thing right away. Let's take this one step at a time, is what this retrosynthetic analysis suggests. And it makes the planning of a synthesis totally manageable. Take a look. As we think about the molecules that this target molecule could come from in a single step, two ways to make ketones that we know come to mind. One is the cleavage of an alkene 
using ozone to make a ketone. And the second is hydration of an alkyne, electrophilic addition to make a ketone. Both of them work, both of them work pretty well. And we could easily think of using both of these precursors to make the molecule we want. So there, we have it. We've done something useful. We know exactly how we could make this target molecule. Now, of course, we now have to figure out how we would make the alkene or how we'd make the alkyne. But in the process of planning precursors, one step at a time backwards, we can work our way to more manageable structures that is easier to synthesize and structures that are more and more like the starting materials we would have available. So this retrosynthetic analysis strategy is a winning approach that I strongly recommend you use, and I'm going to ask you to plan syntheses where it will work far better than guessing starting materials.